Now let's continue by, uh, once we've, we've had that warm up with x squared minus y squared, we're going to start looking at other problems in that same general um, type. First, I want to uh, get rid of a bunch of problems right in one fell swoop. What if you had d equals 4? Remember, d is the number that goes here. So we're looking at what numbers can be expressed as the sum of a square plus 4 times a square. Well, 4 is a square itself. And so you could just write this as x squared plus 2y squared. So it's really um, basically the d equals 1 case. It's really, can I write n as the sum of two squares? And this one happens to be even. But mainly, it's just writing the something as the sum of two squares. Okay, So d equals 4 is not a particularly interesting case. And in fact, in general, it's not even interesting to have d divisible by a square. So if this was like d equals 12, you could take that 12 and take the 4 and took, put it as a 2 squared. Okay, This would reduce to the d equals 3 case. I claim if you understand the d equals 3 case really, really well, you're going to basically understand the d equals 12 case. Okay, So that would be d equals 12. Okay, So we don't really want to worry about when d is divisible by a square. So there's a word, there's a name for numbers that are not divisible by any square, and they're called, guess what, square free. Okay. So um, whenever I make a blanket statement about all possible d's, I won't make that very often, but at the end we will make a blanket statement. Um, what I really mean is all square-free d's, because the ones with squares are not, not particularly complicated to extrapolate to that case. So now let's go back to probably this, the coolest, um, most natural case, which is the sum of the squares. What numbers n can be expressed as the sum of two squares? Very, very um, important problem, motivated a lot of interesting stuff. So let's look at the table. Uh, here's n. Here's uh, if it exists. Here's the sum of squares uh, realization of it. And then I'm just going to uh, put good if it can be expressed as the sum of two squares, and, or yes for good, and no if not. So let's look at what's going on. Okay. Um, we saw a pattern with the x squared minus y squareds, but here it's a little more complicated. It seems to fail for three, six, and seven, eleven, and twelve, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, 19. Um, one thing to mention that's a little bit like what I was just talking about uh, at the start about the square free thing is if the number n is not square free, if it's got a square factor, then clearly um, it's going to just, you can just put that factor inside both of these guys. Okay, So the fact that 20 uh, is 2 squared plus 4 squared, it's really coming from the fact that 5 is 1 squared plus 2 squared. Okay, so if we wanted to, we could kind of strike off the the non-square free ends as well. We're actually going to strike off a lot more than that pretty soon. Okay, um, so it's not really uh, completely obvious what the pattern is, but let's let's not worry about it too much. Let's try the algebraic approach. Okay. Oh wait a minute, that's not going to work at all. If we remember our algebra, high school algebra. Difference of squares and sum of squares are super super different. We can factor the difference of squares, and they always tell us. Uh, probably, they told you in high school algebra that you can't factor the sum of squares. Well, that's just plain wrong if you allow yourself to use complex numbers. Okay, And that's going to be really cru crucial. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? This totally factors if I let myself use i. x plus yi times x minus yi. If you um, do that difference of squares, that's x squared minus the quantity yi squared Okay, just using the difference of squares factorization again. But the key thing is that i squared is minus 1, and that turns it into a plus 1. Aha! So if we let ourselves use i, um, we're going to maybe be able to emulate what we did before. Well, it's going to be somewhat different, but the crucial step is still here. The fact we can have algebraic factorizations and relate them to numerical factorizations. Okay, so what about that? Well, first let me tell you a little bit about um, the terminology and some of the essential algebra of where we're living here. So we're working in, in not in the integers anymore. We're not just allowing our numbers to be integers. We're working in what's called the Gaussian integers because Gauss, uh, the, the you know pretty much the best mathematician of all time, perhaps, uh, was one of the ones who popularized this approach to this problem and used the Gaussian integers for a lot of cool stuff. Um, it's got a fancy name. Z is the name for the integers, and then you put this brackets I to indicate that you're going to take anything that's um, a combination of ordinary integers and integers with an i in them. So this is called z adjoin i. But it's just really the, 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 all the expressions of like 2 plus 3i minus 5 plus 17i. We're still going to use integers because it's still number theory. 
We're not going to allow, it's not the whole complex numbers, it's a subset of the complex numbers. And it's really, algebra, or geometrically, it's the grid of points with integer coordinates. So for example, 3 comma 4 on the grid, that's 3 plus 4i, that's where this little o is, that would be a Gaussian integer. Okay. Um, so a couple things we want to remember about the complex numbers. Um, you don't have to be a master of complex numbers here, but it probably helps if it's not totally unfamiliar. Um, the magnitude of a complex number is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. That's geometrically, it's the distance to the origin, so it's the length of this segment here. I chose this one so that that would actually be an integer, it would be 5, but it's not usually an integer, even if um, x and y are integers. It's the square root of an integer, so it's not so, so horrible. So notice, again, the hint of Pythagoras coming in. This, as soon as we let ourselves use this thing, this, um, uh, this set of numbers, the Gaussian integers, we are doing two-dimensional geometry. And uh, in fact, the further you go, the more the two-dimensional geometry gets, gets interesting and important. I will not use it very much. I did not go that far. Um, but maybe on request, we'll do that. OK, so um, other a couple other things. The complex conjugate of a complex number if z is x plus yi, then z bar is x minus yi. That just flips it across the x-axis. So this guy would flip down to 3 minus 4i. That's a very interesting and useful notion. And one very cool thing is that the squared magnitude of a complex number, which happens to be exactly the quantity we're interested in, x squared plus y squared, okay, um, that it has a very good geometric significance, and it also relates to this conjugate. It's x plus yi, x minus yi. It's just z, z bar. So this is an incredibly natural thing from the point of view somebody likes complex numbers. Oh yeah, I think about this all the time. I think about the fact that x plus yi times x minus yi turns out to be a real number with a geometric significance, the square of the magnitude of that complex number. So this is really anything but an artificial weird thing to do. It's just kind of interesting to do it in the context of number theory instead of like geometry or uh, algebra or calculus. Okay, so this is really another way to say this factorization that we want to try to make use of. It's a zz bar, and I'm going to express it like that quite often. It's just some complex number times its conjugate. Okay, so that's a little bit about complex numbers. Let's go back to this idea of numerical factorization of a complex number in the Gaussian integers. So let's Again, we have to figure out, we have to choose one direction to go. Are we going to assume something's good and then get consequences out of that? In other words, assume a number can be um, expressed as a sum of two squares and see what the consequences are, or try to go backwards and try to figure out what's a sufficient condition for being a sum of two squares. Well, let's try this first. Um, it turns out to be easier to start with the assumption that it's a good n, and then let's pull out what the consequences are and then see if we can reverse stuff. Okay, so if n is, a, is good, if it's a sum of two squares, then we just had the, this algebraic factorization that that's x plus yi times x minus yi. Now we think of it as a number fact. We've got a specific number, and it's the product of two specific numbers. It's just that those numbers happen to be these more general kind of numbers, Gaussian integers, which we better understand at least a little bit eventually. Okay, so let's look at examples. n equals 5, okay, uh, that certainly is 1 squared plus 2 squared, so it factors as 1 plus 2i, 1 minus 2i. Already, that's a really, really, really interesting thing. We've got a prime in the integers, an ordinary prime in the ordinary sense of the word. We've now found a way to factor it in this new larger set of numbers. That's already pretty awesome. And if that's where you stop the videos and you just know, hey, five factors, uh, if you let yourself use i, that's already super cool. Okay. Um, what about 13? Okay. 13 is also the sum of two squares. Okay, from the table. It also, it also factors. Okay, so it's also something, I'm, I purposely picked these guys to start out being primes. Um, again, I, I hinted in the x squared minus y squared case that really we're going to, if we know that what happens for the primes, we're pretty much going to understand everything. Um, so we're going to focus on those. But already, this is super cool. It's a way to factor 13 and not into just 1 and 13. It's an interesting way to factor it. Well, what does every prime factor? Well, let's see. n equals 3. We know it's easy to tell um, by just a case by case analysis. It's not of the form x squared plus y squared. You can try it if you don't believe me. Okay, for integers x and y. Well, so it can't be factored into this special form. Okay, that's another way to say that um, into the special form u u bar, let's say. But uh, we do have to wonder. Well, maybe it does factor, but just in another way. Okay, that'd be pretty cool too. Maybe 
you can break up any ordinary prime from the integers z uh, when you allow yourself to use i math, as my son calls it. Okay. Well, we'll see. So that that's something to figure out. Um, if it doesn't factor in the special form u u bar, does it factor in some interesting way? Okay. N equals seven again. Um, that does not is not the sum of two squares. It's not of this form u u bar. We have to figure out um, what more we can say about that. Some interesting open questions. What about n equals 10? That's not a prime. So I want to show you a little bit about why we can pretty much ignore non-primes. Okay. Well, 10 factors in just the ordinary, ordinary way into the two primes, 2 times 5. But um, what is that? how does that factor? Well, 2 happens to factor as 1 plus i, 1 minus i. You can uh, check that for yourself. 5, we just talked about. Oops, don't want to snip and paste. 5, we just fact talked about how that factors. Okay. Well, 10 is also a sum of two squares. It also factors just on its own. Hmm. Is that a coincidence that the ingredients in 10 both were sum of squares? Or in other words, they factor in this UU bar format in the Gaussian integers. And 10 also factors in the same format. Okay, well, let's see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just reorder this product. 1 plus i times 1 plus 2i. Okay, you FOIL it out, you get 1 plus 3i plus 2i squared, blah, 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 pause if you want. You get minus 1 minus 3i. Ooh, that's really similar, just the minus sign. And then the other two, 1 minus i times 1 minus 2i, the conjugates of these puppies, they give you just the conjugate of what we started with. Okay, so it doesn't look like a coincidence. It looks like the fact that 10 factors in the UU bar form um, is, a, is a consequence of the fact that 2 and 5 factored, and you just reorder these guys. Okay, the minus signs are not really important because there's two of them and they just cancel out. Okay, so we're going to come back to this and and see that it's a very general fact. And basically, it's saying that if two, um, uh, if you have two numbers that are good, then it, their product are going to be good. And so we're going to we're going to focus on the primes for that reason. Okay, just a little bit more before we um, move to the next video. N equals two is a special case. Um, I already introduced you just briefly the fact that two is one plus i times one minus i. I just want to mention, it's not going to be super important to us, but it's kind of cool. Um, if I factor out a minus i from this last one, minus i divided by minus i is certainly 1, then you get a 1 over minus i. Well, here's an interesting, uh, a nice little complex number arithmetic uh, review question, and that is that 1 over minus i is nothing but just plus i. And it's easy to do that, just multiply i times minus i, and you'll see you do get 1. So this is minus i times 1 plus i times i plus 1. Hey, that's a square. Okay, so except for this little guy, the minus i out here, it's looking like 2 is trying to be a perfect square. And in fact, this is something we're going to have to deal with a tiny bit, although it's mostly sweep it under the rug. Things like minus i are very unimportant for most purposes. It's an invertible um, number. It means that you can take 1 over it. In fact, we just did. 1 over minus i was equal to i. Um, the whole thing that makes number theory hard is that you can't divide by things whenever you feel like it. You want integer solutions. Okay, or that's most of what makes number theory hard. Okay, if you could invert every integer, everything would be a lot easier. Okay, so what's an example of an ordinary integer that's invertible? It's minus one. Okay, and so basically, answering questions up to i's and minus i's and plus or minus ones, that's pretty much a good answer in in most cases. Okay, the t the technical terminology is that. Anytime you can take one over something, it's called a unit. And plus or minus i are both units in z, z adjoin i. So very roughly, we would say that 2 actually acts like a perfect square. That's pretty cool. okay? And not the square of root 2 with uh, decimals and you know infinite expansions and irrational numbers. It's really pretty much close to a really simple Gaussian integer, 1 plus i squared. And then you just have to adjust essentially like a plus or minus sign. okay? So. Um, Actually, that's a good place to stop this one.